Um, you've been, you've been men. Well, I'll spend this in Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, 
which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. The unimaginable became a reality in the birth of Jesus Christ. When our sin created a great chasm between us and God, leaving with us no means to come to him, he came to us. He took on human flesh and came to be Emmanuel, God with us. As we light the third candle of Advent, we come to celebrate God's gift of his son to be God with us. pray together. God of our salvation, may the reality of your presence in us and among us become a fresh source of joy as we celebrate the birth of your Son. May all those who come in contact with us encounter not just us, but you, because you are alive in us and are with us always. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I see you and I see you online and we're here to worship the Lord this morning. So stand and join us as we bring him honor and glory for his great gift of his son, Jesus Christ.
devastating fight throughout our country and our world and our COVID. Uh, Lord, I pray that instead of making that the focus of this season, that you would fill our hearts and our minds with what this time of the year means for, for Christians. Yes, may we celebrate that you gave us the most wonderful gift you could possibly give, and 
being seated, I uh, just want to go ahead and invite Miss Betty up. She wanted to share a word with you, but also invite you to find your copy of God's Word and join me in Matthew chapter 1 as we continue our series in Matthew and we back up to the first chapter so we can take in the birth of Christ. But if you'll give your attention to Miss Betty for a moment, we'll uh, allow her to share a word. Just step this way so you're in the light. circumstance that brought these things to be, it would have been overwhelming in and of itself, but it was a God that predicted all of these things sometimes a thousand years in advance, and they were fulfilled. Uh, every I was dotted, every T was crossed, everything was fulfilled to the letter, and uh, only our God could do that kind of thing. One of my favorite sermons I've ever preached at Christmas time was, a, was entitled... It's all about the little things because it focused on the most minute details in the Christmas story that God saw fit to fine-tune just to make sure that everything was right. That's, that's the God we serve. He did all that to bring us his only begotten son, the Savior of the world. But like we saw last Sunday, the most intriguing thing about how he brought those things to pass was the people that he included. What last week we saw, the people that he included in Jesus' lineage. And today we're going to see some people that specifically carried vital roles in the fulfillment. I refer to this as Jesus' resources. Those that he chose to use and how he chose to use them. So look with me. In uh, Matthew 1, we're going to begin reading in verse 18, where Matthew says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold. The virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her, till she brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. 
I want to mention three resources. And I hate referring to them as resources because they were so much more than that. But the first of these was his mother, was Jesus' mother. And two things about her. Number one, she was betrothed. Look at verse 1. It says that all this, uh, that this all took place after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. In those days, Jewish marriages took place. Usually there were two significant uh, occurrences or ceremonies where they celebrations occurred in two separate events. The first of those was the betrothal. The second of those was the wedding. Now, the thing that set those two apart was at the betrothal, technically, the couple was married. And the only way they could break the engagement was by divorce. And divorce, the, the betrothal and the engagement that took place at that involved both families. And so the divorce would have to involve both families as well. Now, here's a key. Uh, the difference between the two is that when they were betrothed, technically they were married. They couldn't see another person unless they got a divorce. But the difference was they did not live together. She still lived at her family home and he still lived at his. And the only way they would come together was when they were wed and joined together and then they moved in together. So you can see it was an interesting period. This was what was going on when Jesus spoke the words in John 14, when he said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, he knew that that was an important part of the betrothal ritual, that the two families would come together, they would share a meal, and the, the groom would propose to his bride by taking a drink from a cup, passing it around by hand to his prospective bride. And if she, if she accepted his proposal, she would drink from the cup as well. Now, the thing that I've mentioned before many times is that that night they would conclude, uh, conclude their time together by going to the door and he would say his farewells, knowing that he probably would not see her again till their wedding day. And what determined the length of that betrothal was how long it took him to add on to the family home or to build a place of their own. And so they were separated from for that time during the betrothal. And that's why he would say, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. That's the coming together. And that was the important part. And you see, Jesus in John 14 was speaking the words as the bridegroom to his church, the bride of Christ. And he was saying, there's coming a day that you're going to feel left alone. You're going to feel like none of this is going to happen. But don't forget that I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That was his promise to us as his church, as his bride, especially in times like these, in the pandemic, in the COVID, and so that we would know that he hasn't left us alone. So that betrothal was crucial. And this was so much more than engagement. It was a commitment, yes. And it was a commitment between a man and a woman. But it, and, and it involved making plans and setting dates and working through all those details. But the difference was when they were betrothed, they had to get a divorce to break the engagement, so to speak. Betrothal also involved both families, as I had said, in establishing and ending that. And that had to be a lot of why Mary felt so concerned when she found out that she was pregnant. She was pregnant. Now, just so you can put it all in perspective, most historians believe that Mary was around 11 years old at this time. 11 years old, if you can imagine, when she found out that she was pregnant. You see, in those days, traditionally, 
an 11 year old girl could get betrothed and knowing that it would possibly take a year and that would be married at the age when she would be married at the age of 12. yes david and stephanie i know that's kind of a scary thought a really scary thought no ideas there none we can vote on that if you want to but <laughs> Imagine a girl that's 11 years old, all of this going on when normally an 11 year old girl is thinking about, starting to think about boys. They're thinking about friends. They're thinking about school. They're thinking about all their athletic competitions and all the social and extracurricular activities. And you throw into all of that, that here's this 11 year old girl that's now pregnant, betrothed and pregnant, 11 years old. That's, that's just impossible to imagine. You add to that, that Luke's account gives the details of how Mary found out that she was with child. The angel Gabriel came to her and told her not to be afraid. <laughs> I don't imagine that calling her a whole lot. Don't be afraid. But he said, do not fear because I bring you tidings of great joy. You found favor with God. And, and because of that, you will conceive and give birth to a son. And you're, give, you're conceiving by the Holy Spirit. And that's a lot for an 11-year-old to take on. A whole lot. Add to that the fact that she was a virgin. That's why her response to Gabriel was, how can this be? I've never known a man. In other words, there's no cause for this to happen. And that's where he said, this is of uh, the Holy Spirit. Now, when, when she said, uh, when Matthew says it was before they came together, that means two things. Number one, they were betrothed. They, they had not yet moved in together. They were inhabiting the same dwelling place. They were still living with their families. So number one, they hadn't come together. Number two, there had been no marital relations. So they were still un, there, there was no, uh, there was no relationship in that sense. So that was her question. How can this be? And, and it's interesting that in Luke's gospel, his account says that Gabriel, uh, <laughs> that Gabriel said that she had, uh, that she had found favor, that she was, had conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she was humble. I love this response. She said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to your word. In other words, I'm just a servant of God. Whatever God wants and however God wants to do it, let it happen. I'm, I'm all on board. That would be kind of a contemporary interpretation. But basically she said, I'm I'm there. And that was humility. That was to me why God why she found favor with God. Her heart. Her heart. So the first resource was his mother. The second resource was his father. Now there are two things about Joseph. Number one, he was a just man. Matthew says, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. Now it didn't say, Matthew didn't say he was just a man. He said he was a just man. Just meant that Joseph was fair in how he dealt with people. Now understand in those days that cities didn't have a yellow page listing of carpenters. You know, there weren't half a dozen that you could go by. Typically there was one carpenter in town. This one was Joseph. He was the town carpenter, just like a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker. There was one of each, and he was the carpenter. And the only way he stayed the carpenter in his hometown was because he dealt, he did what was right where people were concerned. He was just in his dealings, and he dealt justly with all of his clients, with all of his people that he did business with. He was just. But in that context, he also was going to do what was right in regard to Mary. Now, so that you kind of put this in perspective, I said a while ago that she was 11. 
Most historians believe that Joseph was 80 to 90 years old. Now, that, imagine that, Maddie. Uh, <laughs> 80 to 90 years old. Now, kind of to put it in perspective, in, in, the, uh, in the movie and the musical Fiddler on the Roof, Teddy's eldest daughter, Seidel, was 20 years old when she was, when the matchmaker came to her mom and dad talking talking to them for Laser Wolf, who was a relatively young widower. At that time, he was 50 to 60 years old. He was the town's butcher and the wealthiest man in town. And he was, he wanted to be married to Tyler, but she had other ideas. He was 50 to 60, she was 20, three times his age. That's nowhere close to what we're talking about in this. Historians also believe that Joseph passed around 111 years of age, which means Jesus was 20 to 21 when his dad passed. That's why you no longer see him in the picture, especially when Jesus begins ministry. That's why Jesus had so much concern for his mom when he was hanging on the cross that he introduced her afresh and anew to John when he said, Mom, behold your son. John, behold your mom. He was making sure she was taken care of. Making sure. So, this was Joseph. Being a just man also meant that he was considerate. He was considerate. Matthew says that he did not want to make her a public example. He didn't want to shame her in public, but was minded to put her away secretly. That was his consideration. Obviously, this was weighing heavy on Joseph's mind because Matthew tells us that while he thought about these things, that an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. I don't know if you ever get something on your mind and it makes, you hard, it makes it hard to sleep. I'm that type. If something gets on my mind, even if it's just the route I've got to run the next day or the visit I've got to make or uh, someone I'm praying for, any of those things, if it gets on my mind, it's a, going to sleep's over with. And so, so working through that is, is off, it often takes all night long. I don't know if that's how Joseph was. I know that's how uh, Miss Lucille Gibbs was. I know I've mentioned her to you before. And I did a little more research. She passed away in 2012 at the age of 99. Six months short of turning 100. I'm surprised she let that happen because she was a pretty stubborn woman. And Miss Lucille uh, was just precious. She wore so many hats in her day. And back in her day, having been born in 1912, she pursued a master's degree and was a faithful teacher all those years, honored to teachers. Just a faithful teacher. And she loved teaching in church, and she loved leading in church. One of the things that she was, a, one of the groups she was a leader of was a building committee. And they were working through everything to prepare to present it to the church. And when she came before the church that night, she said, I just want you to know this thing got in bed with me last night and would not let me sleep. That was weighing on her mind. Even, even a, a, a lady, a godly lady like her, that had so many ducks in a row and just everything was in its place and yet this one wouldn't let her rest. That had to be how Joseph was. That had to be what was going on with him. It was weighing on his mind when the angel came to him in a dream, which brings us to the last of the resources, his messenger, his messenger. Now, two things about this messenger, his urgency. There's something about news that's urgent that just makes you want to follow through with it. Now, Matthew doesn't specifically identify God's messenger, who God's messenger was here. But most theologians and most historians and commentators believe that it was the same angel that was sent to Mary, which makes sense. Makes sense. Which means this angel was also Gabriel. But when he came to Joseph, he came to him in a dream. And he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. 
That's the same thing he began talking with Mary about. Do not be afraid. But he said it here to Joseph. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. That's where Matthew's focus turns again to Isaiah's prophecy, where he says, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, being translated God with us. What a name. Some people say that you can, you can tell so much about a person through their name. They even say that names speak volumes. William Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet asked, What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Meaning that the name doesn't define the rose. But here's the key. It's been said that words have meaning, but names have power. Names have power. Certainly the name Emmanuel carried great power with it. And I hope that you are, you're joining me in praising the name of Emmanuel because we desperately need God with us in times like this, don't we? We desperately need God with us, Emmanuel, God with us through this pandemic, through the days ahead, just so that we have hope and we have reassurance that there's still a throne and there's still a God on that throne and nothing happens out of his care and out of his protection for his, his children. Emmanuel, God with us. Listen again to his message. Gabriel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. There are some messages that are too good to keep to yourself. Certainly, that's one that we should share, the name of Jesus. He's come to save his people from their sins, and not just his people. He came to his own, his own received him not. That's what John said. But as many as will receive him, to them he gave the right to become sons of God, children of God, even to those who call it was interesting. I'll give, I'll give credit to Justin. He and I were talking the other day, and he came up, and he just, he almost was on the verge of tears, but he was about to jump out of his skin at the same time. He came up, and he said, I don't know if you've seen the little guy that kind of follows me around and helps me at UPS and everything. He said, said he's this close to being saved. He, he, had, he had been talking to me about it and everything, and then he just asked, what do I need to do? He had, he had been saying things like, well, how, how do I need to improve my life? What do I need to do to balance, to, to get everything right? How do I do enough good? Kind of like Nicodemus. And given Justin didn't say you must be born again, he didn't go through all that, but he said, here's how it happens. And he went through the process. Friday morning, this young man prayed to receive Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. He's still in the saving business. He came to save his people from their sins. Celebration for the goodness of God that he still saves his people from their sins. Now, here's the key. He didn't say he might. He didn't say he can. Certainly he might and certainly he can, but he said he will save his people from their sins. That's definitely good news. That's the message that Gabriel bore. Matthew says that Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. So many people were concerned. Why Jesus? That was not in his family line. That wasn't a name of a father or a father's father or great-grandfather, it was the name the angel told him he was to call him, Jesus. One of my favorite 
songs of all time but is is actually a duet and i think i don't i think deb and i've sung this before but the chorus of it says for he's more wonderful than my mind can conceive he's more wonderful than my heart can believe he goes beyond my highest hopes and fondest dreams. He's everything that my soul ever longed for, everything he's promised, and so much more, more than amazing, more than marvelous, more than miraculous could ever be. He's more than wonderful. That's what Jesus is to me. One question I want to ask you tonight. Do you know this Jesus? If you don't, he's come to say to you, you don't have to go through another sleepless night worrying about what will happen if you pass your life. You don't have to fear encountering God in judgment because he's come to save you from your sin. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. I want to lead in a prayer. If you're here or if you're in your home and you're listening to this, it's a simple prayer. And I'll say the words, and then you just simply repeat them after me. Lord Jesus. I'm going to ask everyone to go ahead and say those words with me so that it gives, you may be helping the person next to you pray this prayer, and you may be helping them trust Jesus as their Savior. So everybody just say after me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart. And into my life. And be my Savior and Lord. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you said in your word, if anyone will call on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And Lord, it was said that you that they would call your name Jesus because you came to save your people from their sin. Father, that means that it may very well be that right now someone just experienced the salvation that you can offer. God, that's overwhelming. A new life has just begun. God, I pray you'll give us the opportunity to celebrate someone over that new life you brought to us. God, I pray that the most awesome encounter that anyone can ever have, when the God who created everything we see, touch, taste, and feel, made the universe, spoke it into existence, that God would just come to live inside of them by the presence of Amen.